Hey everybody, it's Dr. Will Cole. We're live here on Facebook Live and Instagram Live. Uh, we've been doing Facebook Lives and Instagram Lives for a while now. Um, sorry, I've been a little bit MIA. We've been busy with a lot of projects, writing a book and seeing patients um, more than ever. So we didn't want to forget you guys too much and make you feel get, get, give you guys a complex. Um, so we're going to talk about food sensitivities and can they be reversed? or can they? And talk about the science and the medical literature about this for those of you that are interested. For those of you who do not know what I do and who the heck I am, if I'm showing up on your feed here, uh, I'm Dr. Will Cole. We see patients around, patients around the world via webcam and phone consultations, via doctor, uh, our virtual functional medicine practice at drwillcole.com and locally in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, my doctorate is from Southern California University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles. And my postdoctorate education and training is in functional medicine, clinical nutrition. We again, we see patients around the world. I'm one of MindBodyGreen.com. Uh, MindBodyGreen is the biggest wellness website in the world. The last time I checked, they have millions and millions of followers. I'm one of their course instructors and wellness experts, where I get to teach and talk about functional medicine for people all over the place, and I get to write about it. And I always loved writing, and I get to live out my writing nerddom every week when we write uh, articles. All right, um, so today we're talking about food sensitivities, everybody, and for those of you who do not know about functional medicine, click in the comment section below over on Facebook, Instagram, uh, where I'll give you more information about functional medicine if you're so inclined to nerd out on that information. All right, so food sensitivities. I think it's first uh, an important uh, point to differentiate the difference between food sensitivities, food allergies, and food intolerances, because these are terms that we are typically throwing around here on the health blogosphere and on comment sections on articles that I write, and they are all kind of debating and discussing and, and, and kind of trying to learn about this topic. So it's important to kind of clear, make it, make it clear what the differences are. Now, food allergies are what you would expect. I think most people are clear on that. These are the typic, uh, typical sort of anaphylactic response, the you know, histamine response. It's this immune-mediated, meaning that it has to do with the immune system, and you typically, someone needs to get an EpiPen, or, and it's, and it's uh, kind of a big deal uh, most of the time with severe food allergies. And then you have food sensitivities. Food sensitivities are still immune mediated, meaning they have to do with your immune system, but they are not the extreme uh, acute response. They are a sort of a low grade systemic inflammatory response, but it's still immune mediated. So this can give some GI symptoms, so gut uh, digestive symptoms, you can still have skin symptoms, you can still have fatigue and joint pain and brain fog and fatigue from food sensitivities, but it's sort of this low-grade inflammatory response that still can wreak ha havoc on your health. So I don't want to underplay it, but it's, it is a different pathway than a food allergy. And then last but not least, there's food, there's food intolerances. And typically with food intolerances, you'll see the intolerance and sensitivity being used uh, simultaneously and interchangeably. But the reality is that truly, by the true sense of the word, the food intolerance is non-immune mediated. So it really doesn't have much to do, directly speaking, with the immune system. It typically has something to do with an enzyme deficiency. So lactose intolerance, the person is me missing lactase, which is the, the, the dairy enzyme. <laughs> My computer's saying muted because we're looking at pictures for a book, if you want to know that uh, secret uh, right now. Uh, so the... Uh, so we're talking about food uh, allergies, intolerance, and sensitivities. I lost my train of thought. So food intolerance is the missing the deficiency. They typically would take enzymes, and then that would be mitigated, or they would have like lactose-free milk, and that would be mitigated. That is different than these immune-mediated responses, which is specifically what we see here most of the time are food sensitivities or what we generally term as food reactivities, some sort of inflammatory uh, response that is immune mediated in the body. Um, so can it be, can they be reversed? Can food sensitivities or food reactivities be reversed or not? 
Well, it's kind of all down to what's going on in the gut, which is what we're talking about here. Your gut, your, your, your gastrointestinal system, it's 80% of the immune system. So 75 to 80% of the immune system is grounded and foundationally in the microbiome in the gastrointestinal system. The microbiome is the collective term for all the trillions of bacteria in your gut. So you have about upwards of up 100 trillion bacteria in your gut and about 10 trillion human cells. So you are, in effect, 10 times more bacteria than human, a sort of sophisticated host for the microbiome. So your gut influences many far-reaching aspects of your health, and you don't necessarily have to have gut symptoms or digestive symptoms to have underlying gut problems. Many people go to the bathroom fine. They think I'm fine there. I don't have any gut problems. But they have latent underlying asymptomatic gut symptoms that are seeing the downstream ripple of the effect of that in their brain or in their joints, in their skin, systemically fueling inflammation, something dysfunctional going on in the gut. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine said all disease begins in the gut and now research is catching up with antiquity that about 90 percent of all chronic health problems that we see today at least to some degree begin in the gut if not entirely uh beginning in the gut but most of them having a microbiome component it's associated it's correlated with some uh, you know long uh, far-reaching systemic dysfunctions like anxiety and depression and brain fog and ADD and ADHD and fatigue and depression anxiety all of the things with the brain as well as autoimmune diseases 80 percent of the immune system again is in the gut as well as heart disease and cancer and and sort of the things that are ravaging the human society begins in the gut Shaman Durek how are you thanks for joining um, so the gut is super important and we have to really realize the gravity of our gut health and how it can play a part in our overall health. So food sensitivities, food reactivities that we're talking about today, they can really be when the gut is unhealthy, when you have things like intestinal permeability, or what's commonly referred to as leaky gut syndrome, anything's fair game when you have gut lining permeabilities and dysbioses, you have imbalances in the microbiome. So you can have food reactivities to common things like certain grains and dairy and legumes and sort of these more immunoreactive inflammatory foods uh, and eggs as well. But you also can have food sensitivities to non-immunoreactive foods because so it's vegetables and fruits and clean proteins and healthy fats. All of these seemingly innocuous, healthy, real foods can still be a problem for some people based on their individual response to these foods. Because the problem isn't the food. So if someone is having food sensitivities to kale, it's not kale's fault. It's the intestinal permeability. It's the immunoreactivity that's causing this overreaction, this overimmune response, this inflammatory response to this healthy food. So really, any um, when you're dealing with functional medicine and really customizing healthcare to the individual, I try not to have a bias as, you know, this is the way that everybody should eat because I'll be proven wrong with the next patient. So you have to look at their labs. You have to look at their health history and then track it and be there with them on the ground and seeing what works in their life and what doesn't work for their life. What does their body love? What does their body hate? And that list is going to look different based on the individual. So first, that, hopefully that's understood, that this is different for different people, and I don't like to make any blanket statements based on uh, you know, generalities. Because with food sensitivities and leaky gut syndrome and SIBO and all of these sort of implications that can go on in the microbiome, anything is fair game. Anything could be a problem. And I've been, the healthiest food under the sun works great for some people and can flare the next person up. So we have to look down to the individual. So labs can help us pinpoint this um, and typically appropriate for cases like this. Um, the second thing I would look uh, look and want to understand here is that there's different aspects of food reactivities. There's something called cross reactivity. Cross reactivity is different. Cross reactivity is uh, foods that are similar enough in structure to gluten, uh, specifically. So if someone is gluten sensitive, they're having gluten reactivities, but they've gone gluten free, but they're still having symptoms. This cross reactivity may be an issue, and it's something that we see a lot. Um, people are asking questions, so. Um, peak tea. Thank you for sending the tea, by the way. It was very nice of you. Um, Vanessa is saying it's important, a healthy mind. Absolutely. If your gut is important for a healthy mind. Some of the, what are the labs you commonly study for client? I will talk about that, Jasmine. Shaman saying, where are you located? Love to see you. I would love, 
to be a part of your health journey. You're um, a hero of mine for sure. Uh, we are based in Pittsburgh, uh, but 80% of our patients are done via webcam. So you can be anywhere as long as you have a computer or and you, we can mail labs to you and mail natural medicine protocols, all of that stuff. So that's all on the website um, for those of you who are interested. So cross-reactivity is something, it's the sort of the case of mistaken identity. It's the um, foods that are similar enough in structure and then something called molecular mimicry happens and your body's tagging healthy foods like gluten-free grains and grass-fed dairy and eggs and coffee and chocolate and all these healthy enough foods. Your body or the person that's having cross-reactivity, the body is tagging these with a gluten antibody. So let's say chocolate's on here. For a cross-reactive positive case, it's not chocolate sensitivity, it's a gluten sensitivity to chocolates. And let's say coffee's on there. It's not a coffee sensitivity, it's gluten sensitivity to coffee. Meaning that these healthy foods, based on individual bio, bio individuality, this person's having a reactivity to these healthy foods. So this is another layer to food reactivities. PT is saying, would love to visit you too. Uh, yeah, awesome, good job. People want to be our patients. That's such an honor. You guys are all people I admire in the wellness world for sure. Um, so um, let's let's talk about this. Can they be reversed? Which is what you guys are all joining me for right now. Um, now, look, my battery is going low here. Sorry, guys, on Instagram. So yes, food reactivities, food sensitivities that are non-cross reactive. Those in most cases can be reversed or at least mitigated dramatically, but it doesn't happen overnight. So I'll put all the medical literature in the comment section below on Facebook for you if you want to get super geeky. But if you just want the layman sort of overview, just keep it basic. I'll keep it basic right now on social media. Uh, it takes anecdotally, and I would say there's research to show this, it takes about 18 to 24 months to, for someone that has really significant gut problems and autoimmune inflammation spectrum issues. It takes about 18 to 24 months to start feeling better. Some people are saying they're geeky. Uh, so it takes 18 to 24 months. You can click the PubMed literature and kind of look at my sort of wording on all of the studies on that. Now, that doesn't mean, mean you're going to wait that long to feel better typically. Typically, it's sort of every month you're moving in the right direction. Some months are better. Some months are worse. But that's sort of the trajectory, the timeline of which someone can expect. There are people, and there's research to show this, and I included it in the article, that are, will start seeing recovery and regained function back pretty quickly, pretty quickly. But that journey, that healing journey takes time. This isn't a quick fix. And my curry is on. Everybody that I love in the wellness world is on uh, Instagram right now. Uh, so the um, cross-reactivity, I would say this. Cross-reactivity, my experience, and there's people in functional medicine that would agree with me that these things aren't uh, things you'd want to bring back in meaning that your immune system is going to remember and it's going to start slowly creating this inflammatory storm again. It may not be overnight, but you'll start fueling that inflammation. And I find patients that are cross-reactive to certain food, let's say they're cross-reactive to eggs or chocolate, and everyone loves eggs and chocolate, right? I mean, but so they have them and they think, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then it slowly, insidiously start increasing inflammation again. And then they find themselves, wait, I'm starting to feel like I used to feel. I don't want to do this. And then they come back and we get back. Uh, you know, back in line to calm things down. So this is all sort of found on this sort of idea that there's this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. I'm hopefully not boring you guys too much, but there's three stages on the autoimmune inflammation spectrum. There's silent autoimmunity, meaning if you ran labs, you'd see positive antibodies, inflammatory markers, but they're not having any noticeable symptoms. And then stage two is autoimmune reactivity, meaning they're having symptoms but they're not bad enough to be full-blown stage three, which is the full-blown ICD-10 code, diagnosis code. But there is, these are end-stage problems, end-stage problems. So there has to be about 90% destruction of your adrenal glands before they label you with Addison's disease. There has to be 80% destruction of the villi of your gut before they'll label it as celiac disease. And there has to be about 70% destruction of your myelin sheath before they, it's bad enough to show, them, show up on an imaging study and label it with MS. These don't happen overnight. 10 years prior to the diagnosis is on average when these autoimmune inflammation issues begin, and there are millions more that will never get bad enough to be stage three, but are somewhere in this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. And now what they're finding is that these end-stage problems like celiac disease are really the end stage of a larger continuum of this autoimmune infl inflammatory reactivity uh, issues that are going on. So it's awesome, Shaman. Thank you so much. 
And thank you all for the kind words. I really do appreciate it. And on Facebook, I don't want to ignore you because I know that you guys are asking questions too. Someone's saying, help, I need you. I suddenly started having reactions to everything. How do I get a hold of you? So um, it's, everything's at drwillcole.com. Uh, everything's on there. We have free health evaluations via webcam and phone if you want to get a functional medicine perspective on what you're going through. And for those of you in the United States, our phone number is 724-772-9833. But that's, you know, you guys can look that up on there. All right, so I think I covered everything. I think I covered everything. So the kind of the next steps for people that this is like, well, maybe this is me is finding out if it is or not, because just be some, some just because something in health looks like a duck doesn't necessarily mean it, mean it's a duck. So we have to like look at what's relevant to your case and be practical about this. Uh, and then we run labs and we customize healthcare to the individual. But hopefully. The content was good here, um, and you can look in the comment section below on Facebook to learn more about this, look at the research, get more extrapolated tips beyond what I explained here. All right, guys, if I didn't ask your question, answer your question, uh, you can uh, always join, go back on Facebook and comment in the comment section because we check it over the week, and we'll try to answer all your questions. All right, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to... Actually, I'll end this first. Okay, guys, I will see you next time we do a Facebook Live, which hopefully will be soon.